Before our presentation, I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters. The University of Iowa's international programs and the university honors program both contribute vital time, talent, and logistical support to our organization. I also thank the Stanley University of Iowa Foundation support organization for their financial support, as well as today's special financial sponsors, Mary Gantz and Nancy Hauserman. So thank you very much to all of them. Uh, we really couldn't put on these programs without their financial support. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Nick Martini. Uh, he is, as I said, visiting assistant professor in my department, political science at the University of Iowa. He received his PhD in 2012 from one of this country's most esteemed departments of political science, the University of Iowa's. Yes, I know, I, uh, going too far there probably. All right, his research uh, has focused on the intersection of international relations and political behavior. That is the role of uh, people, uh, individual citizens in influencing uh, world events. And he studied a number of topics uh, along those lines. Uh, the factors driving public opinion, such as ideology, beliefs, and religion. Uh, how those factors shape preferences on various key foreign policy issues. He's published articles from his research in Political Science Research Quarterly, Foreign Policy Analysis, Electoral Studies, Social Science Quarterly, and others. He's teaching courses for us uh, this year that include uh, a seminar on the 2016 presidential candidates and foreign policy, which I suspect is, uh, uh, on the one hand, must be a really interesting course. On the other hand, maybe there's not as much material as he expected. Uh, so anyway, please join me in welcoming Nick Martini. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit of uh, the research that I'm interested in and, and doing. Um, uh, what I'm going to present for you guys today is uh, some collaborative work that I'm doing with uh, another professor at the university here, uh, Professor Brian Lai. Um, him and I have worked very closely. Um, really interested in the role of public opinion and how that sort of shapes foreign policy. Um, you know, how that it shapes leaders' expectations and, and their actions around foreign events. Um, and so what I'm presenting today is just a piece of this research that we're starting with is um, how public opinion really thinks about alliances. Um, as, I, as I get through, I'll just kind of explain. Uh, it's a very relevant topic. We have many alliances throughout the world, and uh, we're sort of in an environment where these alliances are being threatened. And so understanding sort of how the public thinks about it, um, how you know how and why public support may increase or decrease depending on the context of the alliance i think is is really important and this is something we want to share with you all today so um when we first talk about foreign policy i think there there is this very large expectation that it's it's really tied to the leader right um we talk about obama's pivot to asia we talk about um bush's war in iraq and and it's sort of uh, along this lines that um, foreign policy is very leader specific. The leader decides on the on the mission. Um, the leader decides on the role that we're going to take, and the country sort of goes in that direction. And um, actually, if you look if you look at it, the the leaders are very constrained in the sort of decision making they can actually make. Um, as I've mentioned on the slide here, there the two big categories that you can think of are international restraints on leaders and also domestic restraints on leaders. Um, internationally, you can think of the system as a whole. What does the power politics, the, the geopolitical situation look like and how does that restrain the action of a leader? Um, a small state cannot do nearly as much as a big state can do, largely just because of the power that they maintain. Um, as U.S. policy, as U.S. power has changed over the last 20 or 30 years, you, you can see a change in sort of the way the U.S. can um, implement some of the policies that it may want to. Um, during the, the Cold War in a bipolar system, the U.S. was more restrained versus after the Cold War in a more unipolar system um, versus now when we're moving towards possibly a weakening U.S. Uh, military economic um, right, and, and rising in powers of China and other nations, will U.S. power sort of change? Will U.S. policy change in those? So certainly the, the system itself can restrain the actions that a leader may want to take. Um, 
Inter, uh, talk about interdependence, economic interdependence. Um, another big restraint on leaders. Are we going to go to war with our largest trading partner? Probably not, right? Because you're going to hurt yourself just as much as you're going to hurt another country. Um, certainly, there's a lot of other international restraints, but we can talk about domestic restraints. Um, certainly, the president has a little bit more of a free hand when you talk about foreign policy. Um, compared to, say, domestic policy. But at the same time, um, the legislature, bureaucracy, can have a significant level of restraints on what a leader may want to do. Um, you could talk about interest groups, uh, economic policy, right? We just uh, are looking at, at, at agreeing to the TPP. Um, interest groups had a huge hand in what sort of policy we want to adopt, um, what sort of agreements we're going to have with other countries. Um, and so they certainly have an influence on what the leaders are going to do, what the actions of the president and the administration may actually uh, push through. Um, something I'm interested in is this role of public opinion. Um, certainly it's very debatable on how influential the public can be. Um, there's certainly a big question out there, and I, and I don't think this answer has been completely, answer, completely answered, um, is does the public really matter? Um, many would argue probably not. They would argue the public uh, lacks knowledge, doesn't understand what's going on, foreign policy is a very difficult issue, and so should leaders listen to what the public wants? Um, at the same time, the public, certainly there are some that, right, you do have a segment of the population that is unknowledgeable, but at the same time, you have a very large segment of the population that pays attention to foreign policy, pays attention to what's going on, um, and is relatively stable and coherent in, in what's going on from a foreign policy standpoint. Um, certainly foreign policy issues are more difficult for people to understand. Um, when you talk about domestic policy, we live it, we breathe it, we're a part of it. You talk about health care, you talk about taxes, you talk about possibly other social policies, morality issues, right? Those are things that we touch, we feel, we breathe every day. Foreign policy is more of this abstract sort of um, event, um, which makes it more difficult. But at the same time, people are very good about interpreting what's going on in the world and using information shortcuts to really get a sense of how we should interpret event and really how we should form preferences around the event. Um, so when we talk about what does the public pay attention to, um, there's a lot of a lot of information shortcuts people can use. Um, one that we're very good at using is our elite cues, our media cues. Um, we may not know a ton about what's going on in the world, um, but we can look to our partisan identification and we can look at our elites in that in those groups and get a sense of how are they interpreting the event how do they see the event and if we see the world in, in a in a very similar fashion then those inferences can probably map onto us and we'll get a good sense of what's going on um, people also possess very structured beliefs about how they see the world um, we all see the world a little bit differently we all have uh, sort of a different view of other countries, of the world in general. Um, do we see the world as inherently dangerous, right? Is, are, do we live in a very conflictual world, conflict uh, constantly happening, there's lots of bad countries out there, or do we live in a world where we see the world as generally harmonious, um, there's a few bad apples out there, but generally everybody wants to be good and get along. Those are two very different views on how the world works, and that's going to shape sort of how we form preferences about foreign policy events, how we form preferences about our allies, about adversaries, um, so on and so forth. Um, the last one, though, that I think people pay attention to and the one that we're focusing on in our research is, is some contextual factors out there. Um, the one I'm, of course, interested in is the role of alliances, right? So do we have some sort of a written agreement to defend a country, and how does that change preferences that individuals might have? But there's other contextual factors we can think of. Multilateralism. Um, the public tends to be much more supportive when an action is multilateral. Um, it's a sign of legitimacy. It's not just the action that our leader wants to take. It's more of an international, um, legitimate action that we see as a global community we need to take care of, right? So that's a, it's a different context um, that you could put a foreign policy event into. Um, the role of casualties is another context that you can think of. Um, there's been tons of research that's looked at casualties, and generally the idea is, is casualties go up, support tends to go down, and I think that's mapped pretty well to a variety of conflicts. Um, at the same time, those are conditional as well, depending on the type of mission we're into. Um, is it one based solely on defensive reasons? Um, is it more of a humanitarian crisis? Are we just trying to remove a leader? 
um, how do we view that conflict? And so these different things are going to play a role um, in how we form preferences and how we shift our attitudes towards foreign policy events. Um, so as I mentioned, the one that um, I'm interested in, the one I'm gonna talk to you guys today a little bit about is the role of alliances. And a couple interesting, or at least interesting to me, things that I'm interested in is, um, you know, how do these different con contextual factors really shape public attitudes and support around foreign policy, um, around alliances in general? Um, are we more supportive, less supportive? What are the conditions that's going to make the public be interested in these issues and be supportive of these issues? Um, beyond that, really, how do we evaluate leaders as well? Um, leaders are not going to act the same way depending on the situation. And what we're interested in is, if, depending on the action the leader may take, um, how does public opinion shift on that? Um, so I think a big question, of course, is why alliances? And I've mentioned this a little bit here. Um, if we look at what's going on in the world today, our alliances are being stressed to a point. Um, if we look at Europe, uh, Russia has become significantly more belligerent over the last couple years, um, threatening NATO allies, um, sort of increasing the number of ex military exercises they do, uh, you know, running up right against a, a ally border and then backing off. Um, annexing countries or parts of countries. And I know Ukraine is not a NATO ally, but that certainly sends a message to other NATO allies in the region that Russia is willing to play a role in other, in other countries. Um, if you look at East Asia, uh, China is creating islands out of reefs and putting military installations on them now, which is threatening our allies in the region. Um, China and Japan disputes over small islands. Uh, you've got North Korea. Um, now a nuclear power, and I think just recently claimed that they've miniaturized weapons that they can put on ballistic missiles now. So certainly those are all very significant threats to our allies and to U.S. foreign policy. And what we're interested here is, is how does the public react to this? Does the public support U.S. Uh, supporting our allies, or are we you know, less interested in, in really being involved in this? Um, in 2015, uh, Pew Research Center um, ran a very awesome survey that asked, um, not just in the U.S., but in, in Europe, and asked a variety of questions regarding Ukraine, um, the NATO alliance, and I wanted to, to show a few of their results here because I think it ties very closely to this, this talk and, and what we're looking at here. Um, the question they specifically asked, let me get it here, was if Russia got into a serious military conflict with one of its neighboring countries that is a NATO ally, do you think the U.S. would or would not use military force to defend that country? Um, you know, almost 70 percent, except for Poland, which I thought was quite interesting, only less than half of Poland, but about 70 percent of, of our allies believe that the U.S. would be there to support um, them in case Russia... Uh, became a little bit more aggressive in this situation, um, which I think is good for us, right? It's our allies believe that we are there, that we have we play a credible role in defending our in defending our the region. Um, at the same time, a very similar question was asked that said, if Russia got into a serious military conflict with one of its neighboring countries, uh, that is a NATO ally, do you think our country should or should not use military force to defend? And very interesting now, that percentage drop is very considerable, right? It's okay for the U.S. to do it. We think the U.S. is going to be involved, but should we ourselves do it, that percentage drops considerably. Uh, Canada's the highest at 53, well, we are the highest, but beyond the U.S., Canada's the highest 53%, U.K. 49, Germany only 38%. There were other countries too, but I, I just put these up here. Um, for the U.S., though, only 56 percent, which certainly goes to sort of this credibility issue. Um, alliances only work if they're credible. If you think an alliance is going to falter, um, it's no longer, right? It's, an alliance is a deterrence for a country. To, you don't want to invade because you think it's Big Brother or other partners are going to come and beat you up if you're going to try to mess around with them. Um, but if you don't think they're going to get involved, then that alliance doesn't work any longer. Um, if we believe that public opinion can have a significant shaping on foreign policy, this is sort of worrying that um, most of our allies don't want to get involved. And even in the U.S., which you would hope would sort of be um, the country that would be most involved and most wanting to support their allies, uh, we only had 56% of the public that wanted to, uh, you know, at least challenge Russia 
um, to defend a NATO ally. Um, I put this up because I thought this was quite interesting. There is a very big partisan difference here. Republicans are much more supportive of supporting an ally as opposed to Democrats. Um, but I, it, this sort of leads into sort of what we're looking at. And so certainly this, this were a few questions that Pew asked um, in, the, in the context of Russia. But what we're looking at or what we're interested in is how these different contextual factors are going to make a difference for public opinion. And so we conducted a survey experiment in 2014. Um, it was on the uh, Cooperative Congressional Election <laughs> Study. Um, they ask a very large survey um, right around the congressional election. Um, we had a, a thousand person uh, survey uh, sample that we were able to ask questions on. And what we did was um, put in a, a scenario um, and, and manipulate a couple different parts of the scenario to try to get a sense of how did people feel, what were their preferences around these different um, conditions that we changed um, for the people and, and see how evaluations of the leader and support for the alliance um, changed around those. Um, we had three different manipulations that we were interested in. Um, and, and the reason we did a survey experiment, of course, is, is by changing these different manipulations, we can get a really good sense of how attitudes changed. Um, it works a little bit better than just asking direct questions. Um, it sort of puts people in these scenario and we can get a better sense of it. Um, but we had three manipulations that we were quite interested in. I apologize, that's a lot smaller than I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> it was not that small on my computer screen. Um, okay. Um, wow. I, I can't even see and I'm this close. So um, three things we were interested in. Uh, one was the identity of the ally. Um, there's a lot of research that, that kind of argues that the identity matters, right? The way we see another country is going to, is going to matter on um, should we attack them? How should we attack them? Should we defend them as an ally? Um, we've looked at things like the culture of a country, the threat they perceive, um, are they authoritarian versus are they democratic? Um, the one we were interested in was a religious manipulation. Is it a majority, um, a majority Muslim country versus a majority Christian country? Um, some more recent research has shown that at least when it comes to you know how should we attack mili or how should we act militarily towards a country, um, the public is a little bit more willing to be more militant towards a Muslim majority country versus a Christian majority country. And so we were interested if this identity plays off on on alliances as well. Are we willing to honor an alliance that um, is more Muslim majority than Christian majority? Um, the other one we looked at was the role of casualties. Um, as I mentioned, casualties has been a, a very important uh, uh, characteristic and dynamic that's been studied. But we were curious on if we project high levels of casualties, is support for an alliance going to go down? And, it, and if you tie this to China, Russia, even North Korea, we could probably project that we're going to have a high number of casualties if we ever did decide to challenge them um, to defend an ally. Um, so we had two different manipulations here. We had a very low number of casualties, 100 to 300, versus um, still, I think, relatively low if you compare it to, say, Afghanistan or, or Iraq, but 1,000 to 1,300 casualties. Um, in future versions, which I'll, I'll explain later, um, we're looking at bumping that number even more to see how um, very high levels of casualties might actually play a very different role. Um, and the last is the role of the president. Um, as I said, presidents can decide to do different things at times. Um, in our scenario here, the, the president either decides to um, support our ally, make a statement that we will support our ally, versus making a statement that we're going to let the countries take care of it themselves and we're not going to be involved. Um, and so briefly, uh, I'll walk you guys sort of through um, the scenario here. Um, again, that's very small. So I will um, just kind of summarize here. Um, we gave a very general scenario. Two countries, we've been an ally with this country for a very long time. Um, we then stated if they were a majority Muslim, majority Christian nation, um, and then mentioned that a country to their south has um, started to threaten them and um, is interested in sort of invading uh, a very, I, I believe it was mineral rich, uh, let's see, uh, very mineral rich, env uh, oil rich area land to the south, south of their territory. And the country has amassed 20,000 troops on the border. Um, and there is this expectation that an invasion is inevitable. Um, so we ask a question at the very beginning, which I actually won't be discussing this question today, but um, how, important it, how important would it be for the US to actually intervene and, and defend this country? And so we had a five point scale to sort of understand that. Um, 
Next, we give another little bit of information to individuals and said, um, Pentagon says we could definitely take care of this. However, we would face so many casualties, either 100 to 300 casualties or 1,000 to 1,300, just sort of give individuals a sense of the cost that this intervention may actually bring about. Um, then we ask a, a simple question of if fighting broke out, should we intervene? Yes or no? Um, and in a little bit, I'll kind of show some tables on our results for that. Um, then after that, we, ask, we present a little bit more information. Um, the president um, has asked this aggressor nation to back down, the aggressor to our ally. Um, but the president then can do one of two things. Um, the president can state the United States will defend its ally if fighting breaks out versus another condition where the president says that um, the states need to sort of work it out themselves and the U.S. is not going to be involved. Um, at that point, we ask another question, sort of assessing um, the individual's views on the leader. So evaluating, do you support or not support sort of what the leader is doing in that scenario? Um, we finish the experiment with the very the same concluding text in every uh, scenario here, is that in the end, the aggressor nation actually did invade our ally. Um, but regardless of what the president said, um, the president did not commit US troops. And so this area was annexed by another country and um, right, the, the conflict was over, but the U.S. did not get involved in that. And um, then we assessed one last level of approval with the leader. Um, do you agree with how this was handled? Um, and so what this gives us, um, three different things that I'm going to kind of show, things that we've looked at here is, um, first is what was the general public sense of defending an ally? Did we want to defend the ally? Did we support this intervention? Um, or did we not care at all and just let it happen? Um, then the next parts we're, we're really interested in is, is sort of how we assess the leader in this. How did the public sort of view the leader, um, depending on a number of conditions. If the leader decided to intervene or stated that he or she would intervene versus stating that we would not intervene. Um, but always at the end, we don't intervene. And so we're curious on these different dynamics here. Um, and so I wanted to just sort of walk you guys through some of the results that we've, um, some preliminary results that we've kind of come across at first. Um, first of all, this is the very uh, first question that says, should we intervene in the conflict, yes or no? Um, this is after casualties have, have been stated and after the, um, after the identity of the ally has been mentioned. And what we see is, in general, 74% of the population, or at least our sample, was supportive of intervening to support our ally. Um, pretty good number, and um, you know, goes to the credibility aspect, um, you know, why we should, should defend our ally. Um, certainly, we did not have time to ask questions on why individuals wanted to intervene. Um, would love to be able to ask all those questions. Unfortunately, survey space gets very limited and you can only ask so many questions, but um, I think you can infer at least a lot of literature out there is, has shown that um, the reason we want to intervene is because we've made a commitment um, to an ally. And so we don't want to break those levels of commitments and, and the public sort of looks at it that way. Um, and so a very high number of the public was actually very supportive of going in and, and intervening. When you break it up, um, and again, these are quite small, when you break it up into casualties, and this is the first graph here, um, there's about a 10 point difference depending on how many casualties we might face. Um, th there's a 10 point, about 10 points lower level of support or lower levels of interest in intervention when the casualties are significantly higher. Um, right, goes to this casualty idea. If we expect a very high cost of doing it, we're less interested in actually intervening and supporting an ally. Um, Again, we would like, in, in a future work, we're going to try to ramp that number even higher to see how um, that number changes um, even more. But I, you know, I think this is, a, this is an interesting sign that you know, casualties could certainly um, play a very big role in, in our preferences here. Um, the next one is comparing the Christian versus Muslim ally and, and how does that difference matter. Um, very, very small difference. I think it was like a 3% difference. It was not statistically significant at all, um, which I think in itself is quite interesting that we do look at allies, at least from a religious standpoint, we don't see a difference there. Um, it doesn't matter if they're Muslim, doesn't matter if they're Christian. Um, we are still, we see them as an ally and that's not going to play a very big role there. Um, which kind of goes against some of this other literature that said we're much more willing to bomb a Muslim uh, country, but at least if they're our ally, we see them a little bit differently. Um, in the second stage here, 
Um, this is where the president makes the comment that we're going to either stay out of the intervention and let um, the country sort of sort themselves out, or we're going to intervene um, and be involved here. And in this case, what we saw was, um, and this is actually should be a seven point scale, um, it maxed out at five here though, is that in general, um, if the president stated he or she was going to defend the ally, the, the public responded with much more high, or much higher levels of support. Um, we have this commitment, the leader's making this, uh, honoring this commitment, and the public seems to reward the leader for these actions. Um, in the case that the leader does not want to intervene and states that the U.S. won't, um, public approval drops pretty considerably here. Um, however, we did break it up as well into the actual preferences of the individual. So in this case, this is the individuals that didn't want to intervene in the first place versus the next graph is those individuals that wanted to intervene. And uh, rewarding and, and supporting of the leader kind of maps with how they would, how you would expect. Um, if the individuals didn't want to intervene, they're much more likely to reward the leader for not intervening in the first place. Um, in the other scenario, if they wanted to intervene and the leader said that we would not intervene, um, the leader gets punished pretty considerably for that difference. Um, so certainly this, um, the actual preference of the individual matters, which then ties back to things like casualties and some of these other factors. Um, actually, I don't have the slide for casualties, but if we look at this mapped on casualties, um, there is a very small difference, but the people tend to give the leader a little bit of a pass on this if casualties are a little bit higher, which I think mirrors some of the other research um, that's been done in some of the earlier results here. Um, as casualties ramp up, we're less committed and willing to sort of forgive a president that might be willing to um, sort of back out in these situations. Um, and at the very end here, this is the, the last uh, couple slides measures I wanted to show was um, general approval of the president at the very end of the scenario. So in all of these cases, of course, the U.S. did not intervene. But we have two different scenarios where the leader said we were going to versus the leader did not say we were going to. Um, and this ties closely to, to sort of this idea that um, the public is much more willing to punish a leader who makes a commitment and then decides to back down from that commitment. Um, you know, you send military forces, threaten another country, um, you try to bluff and your bluff is called. And the public then looks at you as either non-committal, as weak, and willing to punish you for doing those sort of things. And these results sort of play out here. Um, the results are a little small, um, but in the scenario where the leader decides to, says we're gonna defend and then back down versus the scenario where the leader just says we're gonna stay out, um, the leader is punished in that environment when um, makes an initial commitment but then backs down from that commitment. Um, when we look at it based on if the individual wanted to support the intervention in the first place, um, those who wanted the intervention to happen are mad at the president regardless, right? The president said he or she was going to intervene and didn't intervene and they're upset. Or the president said they're not going to intervene and never did. Um, across the board, I mean, the approval levels are quite low. Um, although what's interesting here is in this scenario, the people that didn't want the leader to intervene, um, they punish the leader when he or she says we're going to and then decides not to. And it's kind of weird. You, you would... It's hard to infer what exactly the public would want here. Um, they may, you may think that they would reward the leader because maybe the leader came to his or her senses and decided, oh, maybe we shouldn't do this. But in fact, what they're doing is punishing the leader. And we're inferring for this, of course, I didn't have a chance to actually ask why they were doing this, but um, I think the, the inference here is um, the leader broke a commitment, stated he or she was gonna do something and didn't do it. And so now we're going to punish this leader for, for breaking a promise, breaking a commitment. Um, and approval's higher here, where the leader just said we're not going to do it and continued with that. Um, okay, so in conclusion here, um, I just kind of want to wrap up sor sort of our expectations and, and sort of ideas with this. Um, certainly there's a lot more that we're looking to do with this. Um, this was one study we did. Um, we're looking to run a, a couple different studies that look at a lot of other contexts. Um, one we're interested in, and, and there's some other researchers doing very similar thing around alliances, is, is if there actually is a written defense alliance in the first place. Do we care that there is an actual written alliance? And this matters in the case of Ukraine. 
um, we didn't have a formal alliance with them. Um, if we did, would that have been different, right? And, and we could play those different manipulations. Um, the level of casualties, how that plays a role. Um, we've got some small results here, um, but we're looking to see how that number changes dramatically depending on um, the number of, of casualties. If we did get in, into an intervention with Russia, with China, with North Korea, um, we would expect that casualty number to be considerably higher. And would public support be there if we're looking at 10,000 casualties, 20,000 casualties, 25,000 casualties? Um, just the change of 1,000 casualties dropped public support by 10 points. You know, I'm not assuming that it's going to be that same amount for every 1,000 casualties, but I would assume that that a number could drop pretty considerably, and we're interested in looking at that. Um, also, as I mentioned in the beginning, people take cues from their elites and from the media, and we don't have that built into this experiment. So we're looking at adding things um, sort of like what do congressional elites say about the intervention? What is the president saying? What's the international community saying about the intervention and how that may shape public opinion? Um, but generally, I think from the conclusions is, is that we can take away from this, and I think this mirrors pretty closely to the Pew results and other studies that have been out there, is that we generally are supportive of our allies. Um, and we want to defend our allies when we can. Um, and we do look down upon leaders that are not willing to do the same thing. Um, at the same time, there are some conditionals out there, right? Casualties can play a role and, and it can decrease um, our support. Um, the identity of the, of the ally, at least from a religious standpoint, doesn't seem to play a role at all. Um, um, also, just the level of support um, certainly plays a matter, um, or the, the, the preference of the individual plays a matter in their support. Um, lastly, which I think is sort of this sort of big picture for leaders is um, if you're going to bluff, you better hope your bluff doesn't get called um, because the public is willing to punish you if you're going to bluff. Um, if you really don't want to commit to something, you're better off just not committing. Um, those that wanted you to commit are going to be mad regardless. Uh, those that don't want you to commit are going to be even more upset with you if you decide to then back down afterwards. So um, anyways, um, Sort of big picture, um, thank you all for um, listening and I look forward to your questions. All right, well, I'll start off with this one for clarifying some terminology. Um, the questioner wrote, if conflict breaks out, it is not the same as if warfare or military, militarized conflict breaks out. Uh, do you think that's a, an issue uh, you should have consider considered uh, in your uh, survey? And uh, uh, any consideration of the impact of civilian deaths or casualties, and uh, do you have any? Uh, did you did you have any ability to consider evaluating the intensity of preference or the saliency of the issues in public opinion? So there are some uh, methods questions for you. Okay. Uh, okay. So that was uh, okay. So uh, militarized conflict versus just sure. conflict per se. Sure. Um, Certainly there's a difference here, right? Uh, we could be in a very small conflict, just uh, bombing versus a, an all-out war, and that's certainly gonna play a very significant difference. Um, I think the, generally the expectation is though is that a low-level conflict can turn into a high-level conflict, um, and it can very quickly, and so we don't even want to engage in a low-level conflict, especially with a country like Russia, China, um, because it very quickly could turn into a high-level conflict. But I think that certainly is a consideration, is uh, the level of conflict, the level of intensity. Um, I think to some degree we start that with by um, mentioning the 20,000 troops that have been amassed on the border. Um, we could certainly change that number and see how that sort of signifies to individuals the level of conflict that that could be. 20,000 is a relatively low number. We could say 100,000. We could say 200,000 troops. Um, and we could um, break up sort of the, some of the other conditions to show how intense that conflict could be. And I think that certainly would play a role um, in our calculations. Um, and I think that would tie very closely to expectations of casualties. Um, if a country is ramping up 200,000 troops on the border, um, that's going to signify a much higher level of conflict, higher level of casualties than 20,000 or 10,000 troops or something. Um, the next part of the question, I'm sorry. Yeah, part two. Was, part two. Uh, the uh, civilian deaths. Oh, certainly. Um, yes, I think that would. Actually, yeah, just I'll put it here. Um, we didn't. We didn't. Um, for this study, we didn't look at it. There's a lot of costs that you can consider for conflict. Um, 
we tend to look at U.S. military casualties because that when we talk about our conflict, that's sort of the number that people sort of pay attention to, right? Is the number of casualties that have occurred um, from a U.S. standpoint. Um, and the public sort of uses that as a sign of how well is the conflict going. When we have higher numbers of casualties on a month by month basis, the public sort of infers the conflict's not going as well as opposed to a situation where com we, you know, the number of casualties drop. Um, civilian deaths, they're reported, but they're not, uh, I don't think they're paid as much attention to. Um, but certainly I think that's an important consideration and something we could build into the study um, to see how civilian deaths um, might play a role. Um, another thing that has, has been played out as well that, that we don't have included, which we certainly could, is the number of casualties on the other side. Um, maybe the war looks better if we lost 100 casualties, but we killed 10,000 of them or 1,000 insurgents, right? That's a, a different sign. And there, there actually has been some research that's looked at that and showed that that ratio really matters, that... Um, uh, for example, in, in a terrorist situation, um, we have some sort of a military operation, um, five U.S. casualties were, were had, um, you assess public opinion on that case versus a similar scenario, but we say five U.S. casualties and 25 insurgents were killed, right? And it gives this ratio, and people are more supportive if you see this ratio that shows that um, we killed more of them than us sort of idea. Um, so certainly I think those things can play out, and we could include those. Um, Survey space and the number of manipulations, of course, is, is somewhat limited on those. But uh, I think all of those would be very useful. Um, the intensity of preferences, salience of the issues, of public opinion, certainly. Um, we weren't able to ask really how involved the individuals wanted to pay attention to the event. Um, uh, it's, it's especially in a, in a scenario, scenario like this, it's hard to see are they paying attention to it because we're just giving it to them. Um, but that is really a big, big deal. Um, are people paying attention? Do they care about foreign policy? Um, those that don't care about foreign policy aren't gonna really pay much attention to how a war is going and if that really matters to them. Um, so I think that salience and that interest in foreign policy certainly could play a role in this as well. And that's something we don't measure, of course. So, um, but, okay. We actually had a couple of questions just asking you to uh, talk about the demographics of those who uh, took part in the survey experiment and uh, the sampling, and then also what uh, question you use to measure their approval of the president or the leader. Sure. So the, um, the survey was done by, um, it was the, uh, as I mentioned, actually go to it here, the um, Cooperative Congressional Election Study. Um, it is an internet survey that's done. Um, they've been doing this for a number of years, and I, I would say they're a very reputable um, group that does this. It's a, a large number of academics that sort of put the survey together, and, and it's conducted. Um, it's, it's certainly not a representative sample in the sense of a telephone survey, and even telephone surveys have problems with representative samples. Um, but it is an internet survey, which does have some concerns with um, the representativeness of them. Um, at the same time, we're looking for an experimental manipulation. How does this change from one situation to the other? And we're randomly assigning these scenarios, and so in that situation of random assignment, there shouldn't be a difference if the demographics don't look identical. Um, because you have, you should have a similar number of individuals, or at least their demographics should look similar in both cases. Um, and we looked at those, we didn't see any big differences uh, between the demographics to, to make us concerned in that case. Um, so one manipulation change in one group versus a manipulation change in the other group, you shouldn't have a very significant difference or, or a concern there. Um, I'm sorry, what was the next question on that? Uh, okay. The wording of the approval question. Oh, the wording of the approval question. So we had a couple different wording uh, approval questions here. Um, this is the first one. Where would you place your approval of the decision of the president? This is one the president mentioned. Are we going to intervene or not intervene? And it's a seven level, um, sort of a level of approval um, from approve strongly to disapprove strongly. Um, in the final concluding text, it's very similar. Uh, where would you place your approval with the way the president handled the situation? So very similar question, but it's at the very end of the scenario. And again, it's a seven point um, measure of approval for the president. Okay. 
All right, Nick, we're done with the political science stuff. Uh, now we're getting into the real nitty gritty here. I've got uh, two questions on a similar theme. Um, has the recent uh, activities of Trump changed your thinking regarding public opinion? <laughs> and do you have a sense of what the public pushback would be if a fascist is elected? Now, I know that's a related question because they then write, have you conducted any surveys in Iowa regarding Mr. Trump? Anyway, can you talk to us a little bit about Mr. Trump? Oh. <laughs> Trump is an interesting character. Um, it's really hard to peg Trump on his foreign policy. Um, and I. I, I say that because I spent a good amount of time last week actually going through the internet looking at what a lot of these experts in the field were saying about Trump's foreign policy. And um, everyone you read had sort of a different interpretation of what Trump would do, which um, is interesting. Uh, we don't know in a lot of cases. Um, certainly he has taken a stance on some issues as in a border fence. Um, trade relations, right? He, those have been consistent themes, um, sort of this idea of, of a US first sort of mentality. Um, some would argue he's a very big departure over current US foreign policy. Some would argue he's not that much of a departure. And I'll give you an example. Um, one individual mentioned, well, Trump seems to be okay with authoritarian leaders, right? He says uh, Putin is, is a good leader and, and China has good leadership. Um, is that too far off from all the authoritarian leaders that we've supported over the years, right? Um, I, I'm not saying that, that he's mainstream US foreign policy, but I, I, there are some examples where he may not be all that different. Um, at the same time, and, and actually we had a, a discussion on this on Friday, um, one of my colleagues brought up a very important point is, does this uncertainty with Trump, if he became the leader, what does this mean for uh, our allies and for countries around the world? Um, if they don't know what Trump's going to do. Are you more or less concerned out there um, if you're a US ally or if you're another country? Um, uh, and certainly I think that that could be a, a valid consideration. Um, we're still early in the election season though. So especially when we get to the general election, um, you might see a little bit more um, focused and directed policy coming out of Trump. Um, but again, it's, it, is, it is very, mixed right now on exactly where he stands on some of these issues, so. Our foreign policy is going to be so great. <laughs> and that's a constant theme that he does it's talk great. about. It's so. great, yeah, so great. Um, all right, so one question I would like you to circle back to something you mentioned briefly at the start, um, and that's the uh, question of whether public opinion matters at all uh, in the conduct of foreign policy, U.S. or in other countries. And, um, you know, so uh, findings like yours, how much do they tell us about uh, the real domestic constraints that a leader faces? Sure. Um, I mean, certainly that's, that's the big question, right? Do leaders care about the public? Um, I would argue yes, they do. Um, if leaders didn't get in front of the, t if, if our president get, didn't get in front of the TV and try to sell an intervention in say Libya to the American people and try to frame it as this is the right thing to do, we have to defend US interests, Gaddafi is a murderer, killing his own people, right? Harping on the humanitarian issues, also mentioning the US security aspects of it, trying to frame it as this is a necessity of the US um, it's a multilateral intervention that our allies want us to get involved in. Um, if public opinion didn't matter at all, I don't think the leaders would do that, right? What would be the interest in doing that? Just do it, be done with it, and ignore what the public's going to say. Um, so I think in that sense, the public matters. Um, at the high level, we vote. We pick who our leaders are. Um, that matters. Leaders pay attention to that. Um, it shapes the type of interventions we get into. Um, a land war, land war might be the right course of action. Technically, it might be the feasible way of actually conducting a, a policy. Um, at the same time, it may not be the most politically feasible action, and so we move to an air war. Um, it's a lot safer to do an air war. 
You have a lot less casualties. And so leaders may consider that. Um, at election time, it's going to matter what the important inter what the important issues are. Um, in 2008, it was certainly all about the economy, and foreign policy sort of took second stage there. Um, I think in 2004, foreign policy really played a big role in that election with terrorism in Iraq. Um, and so foreign policy isn't always going to matter in an election. I mean, it's always going to matter to some degree, but I think there's going to be some conditions out there when foreign policy will matter more than others. Um, foreign policy has sort of been ignored for a, a large part of the election so far. I mean, there's been comments here and there, but, but not as much as I would sort of expect. Um, that may change in the next few months, but um, certainly I think it matters. I don't think it can always matter. I think at times when the economy is, is in the dumps, um, that could matter more. But I think there's a lot of cases where foreign policy will matter and how people form preferences. And if a leader messes up in an intervention, um, that can have a huge impact on their approval and their electoral implications. So. We've actually got a number of uh, questions that are kind of uh, uh, very impressively asking you to uh, how other kinds of um, uh, survey things you could investigate even, uh, so for future research. Uh, one asked about uh, whether um, it would matter for the kinds of things that you've been studying, uh, whether the, the military that would do the intervening is a volunteer army as at present or produced by a general draft. Um, another asked what if the aggressor in the scenario was the ally and uh, against a, a non-ally, and we were being pressured by the ally to come in on the side of them as the aggressor. Uh, how do you think public opinion would change under those kind of scenarios? Um, certainly, I think there's lots of different uh, ways we can sort of analyze this. Um, and that's the beauty of doing experiments is we can do lots of these, and it depends on how much money you have, of course. Um, they are a little expensive to do, but we can keep doing them to sort of get a sense of these different scenarios. Um, with a draft army versus a, a volunteer army, um, I'm not sure initially how that may play a role. Um, I think that may depend on sort of how long the war drags out, the level of casualties you have. In, in those cases, that may play a role a bit. Um, with who the aggressor nation is, I think that certainly would matter. Um, if our allies being the aggressor nation, that's sort of a very different situation than our ally is getting attacked by someone else. And I could see public opinion being less supportive. And, I, and I, if I remember co correctly, I think some studies, at least some preliminary studies um, that others have done have sort of looked at this. Um, when there's a little bit of ambiguity over who started the conflict, um, if our ally is the one that's actually the aggressor, public is a little less supportive um, because it's not a fact that our um, ally is actually being threatened. It's they're the ones actually doing it. And so do we really need to intervene in this case when they started it, I think, is sort of a different story there. Um, but certainly something that can be tested. So. Okay, I think we'll have to have this be uh, our final question. Um, it's a really good uh, set of questions uh, this afternoon. Um, this question um, is asking about um, the emotional impact at the time of the attack on the ally. Uh, so uh, sort of by analogy to the ISIS beheadings or remember the main or other instances where what prompts the issue at hand uh, is uh, something particularly emotional and how that might play into public reaction. Um, I think the emotion plays a huge role. Um, you can directly uh, sort of frame the focus of an intervention by, um, and, and we could have done that. We could have shown a video that showed a beheading or, or you know, children killed or something along, or, or some level of casualties. And certainly that has an emotional impact on the public. Um, with the migrant crisis in Europe, no one really paid too much attention to it until they showed a child on the beach that had drowned and died. And all of a sudden, then public got all involved, cared a lot about it, and leaders started scrambling to for formulate policy around it. So I think the emotional piece is huge and plays a very big role in shaping how we sort of um, perceive an event and the sort of form preferences around that. Um, incorporating it, um, I haven't thought too much of how to incorporate it. I think it certainly could be done. It could be a little difficult, especially in a, a more generic scenario like this. Um, 
But I think incorporating an emotional cue certainly could play a role in sort of getting a sense of how emotion plays into that. Um, but good, good question. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Nick, for your presentation today. Before we conclude, let me mention once again uh, those who've made the talk possible. University of Iowa International Programs, University of Iowa's Honors Program, the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization, and for today's presentation, financial sponsors Mary Gantz and Nancy Hauserman. We're very grateful to them, and thank you to City Channel 4 for making our programs available to the viewing audiences. Uh, Nick, as a small token of our appreciation for your talk today, I'm pleased to present you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Here you are. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. We're adjourned. <laughs>